Thank you for joining me on this episode of Next Bite of Life podcast. My name is Kem Kem. Today, I've got a special guest by the name of Stephen Williams. Stephen is a YouTube creator and an author. I'm so thrilled to have you on the show today. How are you doing? Hello, I'm doing well. Good to be <laughs> Thanks. here. <laughs> Thanks for, for, for you know coming on the show. I'm so thrilled. Of course. I wanted to talk to you about a few things. Now, absolutely. right off the bat, I got to say, you've got like almost 400,000 um followers on youtube that's incredible i mean oh, thank it's you. absolutely fantastic how long did it take you to get up to that kind of number mm, up until right about just now so probably about three three and a half years something wow. like that um so i've probably done about a hundred thousand a year that's uh, amazing since i've been on the platform wow. um so yeah, I've been I've been very fortunate in that regard. So I'm very, it's funny. I'm very grateful that that really wasn't a mountain that I had to climb. That oh, kind of happened great. very easily. Yeah. You know, I, I was I was praying. You know, I was praying, God, please let me get to a hundred thousand <laughs> subscribers. And I was like, in 2019, I, it was like 2019 or 2018. I was like, I'm gonna get a hundred thousand subscribers. I really want to do it by the end of the year. And then it happened in like six months. It's amazing. Um, wow. So, yeah. Uh, I couldn't so even really dream that high. I mean, I can't even dream that high <laughs> on any platform, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or whatever. So I really admire people that can make it work. Now, before oh, we start you. and dive into the travel and everything else, tell us where you're at now. I am currently in Maryland, in Towson, Maryland, where I was born, where I was raised uh, I've been here now since July, so probably about five months I've been here since the pandemic started. My family is here. Um, before this, I was in New York. I spent the past 12 years in New York, New York City. That's where I went to school. That's where I got all my work experience, my internship experience. That's where all my friends are. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, that's where I was before this, um, minus a little year that I took off to uh go live in spain okay great we're gonna get back to, to, to that later but i wanted to move back just a little bit <laughs> you were in um new york for 12 mm -hmm. years how was it living in new york yes how was that like Oof, uh <laughs> you know so many so many different adjectives that i could use to describe life in new york um but for me um new york was great um for the simple fact that new york was for me new york was very much for me um and that is kind of a thing with me in travel i know when a place is for me the first time that i go the first time i went to new york city i was 10 years old mm -hmm. we got off the bus in times square and like i walked two blocks and i just knew i just knew wow. it was like a flash of clairvoyance in my brain and i just knew that i was going to live there one day um i was absolutely certain um, so yeah, New York was for me until it wasn't. Until, <laughs> now, <laughs> until it wasn't. <laughs> the pandemic has really wrecked havoc in a lot of lives and a lot of plans. And where were you when it first happened? And when did you say, you know what, it's enough. I need to like go back and regroup somewhere. Well, you know, I had been wanting to leave New York for a while. Yeah. Um, you know, I have got, because of my career, I have gotten to travel to Los Angeles quite frequently. Um, and as I got older, matured, just my preferences for lifestyle just changed. Just changed yeah. they, they, they changed. Um, and, you know, every time I would go to L.A., I, I wouldn't want to leave. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> you know? like me a few years ago. You know? <laughs> I, just, I never wanted to leave. It would be so hard to get me on the plane to go back to New York, uh, leaving L.A. Um, and, you know, so a lot, of, a lot of what we've seen happen because of the pandemic in terms of the economy and work and things like that, you know, homelessness and all of those things. In places like New York City and San Francisco, those things were already happening. Yes. 
Um, and those things have been happening in New York City for quite some time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and you could kind of just see New York going on this like downward, downward trend over the yeah. past few years because of the inequality, inequality gap. It just keeps yeah. getting bigger. The homelessness problem in New York keeps getting worse. The, um, the city just keeps getting dirtier and dirtier yeah. and dirtier. Um, and I just, you know, I didn't want that for my life anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, I don't know that if it's was that, better in LA. <laughs> it's a little, well, and that's you know, the thing. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a little better in LA in the sense that LA is, is much, is much more spread out. Well, that's true. And it's yeah. much larger. Yeah. Um, because when we, when we talk about Los Angeles, we're talking about, we're talking about Los Angeles, the city. Yes which has a lot of these problems that we're talking about. Yeah. But when people really talk about Los Angeles, it's talking about Los Angeles, the city and Los Angeles County, which is huge. That's true. That's very um, true. And so Los Angeles County, you have so many different, you know, you've got so many different types of areas. You've got wooded areas. You've got mountain areas. You've yeah. got lake areas. You've yeah. got beachy areas. There's just so many different types of things in terms of lifestyle that you can get into. Um, in Los Angeles. Um, and so that is really, you know, what I'm looking for. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the in economic problems are still going to yeah. be there because they're all over the United of States course, right now. Yes. Um, but when it comes to just a peaceful, quiet, green, you know, natural lifestyle, LA, yeah. is, uh, LA is the place. Uh, um, one know, of many places, yeah. but that is the place for me. <laughs> It's funny when you said that, you know, you just knew and you didn't want to leave LA every time you went, you know, you went there. I used to live in Boston and every time I would visit LA, it's like uh, every uh -huh. weekend, I had every week, every other weekend off and I would go to LA like, for, and then it's like, oh my God, it's getting really hard to go back. And I always wanted to, even while I was in school, I wanted to live there. And finally, after one big, huge snowstorm, I was just like, this is it. I'm going to take my test. And if I pass, that's it. And I did. And I holed up in a motel in Hollywood for a while. And I passed wow. the test and I gave my notice. And then my company is like, you know, we're expanding to Los Angeles. So anybody who wants wow. to move. And I was like, yeah. So that's how I end up like moving to LA. So it was just like I finished work here like on a Friday and I started there mm -hmm. like you know a week break and I started the the, wow. the following week. So it was great. And it was great for 20 years. But while I was there, I still had this urge to live in San Francisco. I'm like, that is it for me. Because it sort of reminded me of Boston, but it was, you know, <laughs> you're in you were in California, but I got there and right. I saw the homeless problems and I was working in the Castro yeah. district and it was just like it was terrible but you know here's the thing. yeah i can't imagine i've never been to san francisco uh, but i've heard how bad this that problem is there oh and the thing is i can't even imagine what that must be like because i know how bad it is in new york and i also know how bad it is in la and that already is, is unbearable because yeah and that's what everybody says it's worse yeah, because it's smaller and you come out of the the metro stop or you know the bus line or the, the, and you just see, and there's a lot of like young girls who are like pregnant out to here. And it's just like really sad because you're saying to yourself, you're somebody's kid. You really should go back home. You're 16. You know, the hippie era has ended and it's just, but you know, at one point, and I think it's probably still the same. San Francisco gives the highest amount of money to the homeless people, like, you know, so everybody does the journey. All the homeless people from everywhere go there because that's where they get the most money. So it's just really, really bad. And after my six months working there, I was like, never. I mean, it got rid of yeah. my taste for wanting to live there, you know. Yeah. Even if you live like, you know, in the fancy places, you still have to come down and see right there right you're confronted right. With it all the time like in la you can sort of go like okay if i don't go to venice beach or whatever you you know you can sort of compartmentalize it you know you can if i go downtown then i'm okay but i used to work like the farm oh, no, not downtown is it's it's bad now they're everywhere downtown to, like homelessness is everywhere downtown now yeah in LA. i used to work with this um uh, pharmacy and we, we we worked a lot with the hospices like you know end of life mm -hmm. care and all that so I had to go like once a week to go to the, I actually bought a really banged up used car 
to like take with me, you know, to drive there when it was that day. Mm -hmm. And I only drove it that day, but it was worth it because I couldn't take my regular car. It was just that bad, right. you know, of a problem. So I can just imagine, and this was like, I left LA like, you know, 10 years ago. I can just imagine what it's like today. So where would you be like in LA? Which part of LA would you go to, you think? Um, you know, I have a preference for water. Uh, and I have a preference for wooded areas. Ah. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, somewhere by a beach or somewhere up in the mountains, you know, surrounded by trees or maybe somewhere like a little up, you know, outside on the outskirts by like one of the lakes. Um, you know, I really like very, very natural environments. Um, and I probably have New York City to thank for that, that that yeah. has become my <laughs> preference because for 12 years, I was like, I was surrounded by concrete and skyscrapers. Yeah, um, it's funny how I'm, your your needs change as you grow older, isn't it? <laughs> what you thought exactly. was the most important thing is no longer it. <laughs> Correct. That is exactly what happened. So now uh, talk to me about like, the cost of living in New York for a single person, for instance, like tell you, know, just try and, Horrible. yeah, try and tell us like what it was like, you know, how much you spend on rent and food. And... Uh, well, here's the thing, you get used to it. You really do get used to it. Yeah. Um, but it is an outrageously expensive city. Um, if anyone has ever been to, you know, places like London or San Francisco, it's, it's very, very similar in terms of uh, cost of living. It, it's very abnormal and outrageous <laughs> how much things cost. Um, you know, like a fast food meal might cost you, probably will cost you like anywhere from 12 to $15 to, you know, to go to McDonald's. I don't eat McDonald's, but I'm, yeah. you know, if you go to McDonald's, you're gonna spend about $12 on your meal. Um, and rent, I mean, if you're trying, if you're trying to get a one bedroom, um, and, and this is pre pandemic, yeah. um, things have changed because of the pandemic, but before the pandemic, you're talking rent. Um, I'll put it this way. When friends would visit my apartment, my last apartment, they were shocked <laughs> that I was not paying $2,000 or more because that would have been the norm for an apartment like the one that I had. Um, but I found the most outrageous deal, um, uh, this beautiful apartment. It was renovated. It was on the same block as an express train. Okay. Uh, an express <laughs> yeah, which train. is golden, right? Like, right. and I think I got in at like $1,600. Wow. And it was a one bedroom, a, a huge one bedroom. Like my bedroom was huge. <laughs> My living room is huge. Like all things that just don't happen in New York in City. New York, yeah. And people were like, people were like, how did you find this? Were you, were and, you looking for cracks of mold and stuff like that? Thinking they, they didn't tell me something. So you well, see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I had been going and looking at apartments and, you know, they were showing me just crap. Crap after crap after <laughs> crap after crap for so much money. Um, and you know, I went back to my job, I went back to the office and I was really frustrated and I said, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. My apartment is out there and I know it is. I know it is. I know it is. So I just sat there for an hour and just booked. I like booked like just appointment after appointment, after appointment, after appointment, left the office <laughs> cause I was booking them for that day. It was like the morning I, I and I was like, now. I'm booking these appointments for yeah. today because I'm going to find my apartment today, left the office. <laughs> and like, from like probably about 2 PM in the afternoon to about <laughs> six o'clock at night, I was just pulling apartments. And then the apartment I moved in was the second one that I saw that day. Um, and, and yeah, it was a very nice building. Like the building, it, 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 here's the thing, it was exactly what I wanted. I had very specific sort of uh, parameters for what I wanted. I wanted it to be, you know, west of Broadway. I wanted it to be ideally near a park or something like that. It was west of Broadway, surrounded by three different parks. 
uh, coming in at less than $1,700, one bedroom. Um, the building didn't have a elevator, but I was on the first floor. Yeah, so you're like, yeah, However, okay. <laughs> the first floor, people were like, oh, well, you know, people are always gonna be walking by your window. Not exactly, because the first floor was about six feet above the ground. Oh yeah, so it's, um, <laughs> he has to be a very tall person. <laughs> so it was right. So it was it was just the most perfect place. Um, I actually talk about it in my book. <laughs> oh, that's. <laughs> um, I actually talk about, about it in my book. <laughs> well, yeah, because and also the, the great thing about it for me was I moved to a predominantly Spanish speaking neighborhood. Okay. I moved to a predominantly Spanish speaking neighborhood um in a great great building in a renovated apartment that was very very economical for me and spacious um and i got very very lucky in that regard but back to your initial question you know the average one bedroom in new york would run you at least two thousand dollars you know the average studio anywhere from fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a month and then on top of Um, that you add your food, right? Yep. <laughs> Which yeah, was food. guesstimate? <sighs> probably about, for me, probably about anywhere from 75 to to $100 every time I would go to the grocery store. Um, so and in New York, you kind of have to... You gotta have to go to the grocery store often in New York, unless you have a car, which nobody does. (laughs) You know, it's not like, you know, it's not like, you know, you go in the grocery store, you load everything into your cart and then you load everything into your car. It's like, no, I have to take what I can carry home. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like, okay, I'm gonna get this today. And then I know I'm gonna come back in three days and get the rest of the stuff that I didn't get so I can carry it. but were yeah, the utilities groceries were expensive too. Utilities were actually not that bad. Really? Okay. Utilities were not that bad. It would get a little bit um, in if if it got like really cold in the winter, mm-hmm. or if it got really hot in the summer and you really had to blast the heat or you really had to blast the uh, AC. Mm-hmm. Um, those couple of months, like, the utilities would go a bit higher, but generally. Generally, I think generally in the U.S., utilities aren't that bad no, across the. I mean, they're they're it's more expensive than they are in Spain, but they're still not nah, really that yeah, bad. Yeah. Um, so, so utilities if, are if okay. You, if you were to guesstimate how much you were paying per month, would you put it roughly three thousand for something like that? Oh yeah, my my total expenses were about three thousand dollars a month. So mm-hmm. that's very expensive. I mean, compared yeah. to a lot of places. Now, did you have mm-hmm. a, a huge culture shock when you went from Maryland, right, to New York? Like, pay Maryland prices, or is it just almost as expensive? Did you have a? You know, I did not go through culture shock because you know I was very fortunate. You know, I've been able to travel quite frequently throughout my life ever since I was a child. Um, so I was very familiar with New York City. Okay. So I had you- been there. You know. I moved there when I was 18, but like I said, the first time I went, I was 10. Um, And from 10 up until 18, when I finally moved there, me and my family would visit New York two, three times a year. Uh, So I was very familiar. I knew what to expect. I knew what I was getting into. The university I went to, I actually did a summer program for two weeks there in New York City while I was in high school. Um, So so yeah, I was very familiar with New York City. So yeah, there wasn't really a whole lot of culture shock. And also... What I found was, this might sound crazy, but for me, it was more, I had more culture shock being born in Maryland. <laughs> like, that was my culture shock. You're like, like I belong in New York. What did I, what well, it was I like, here? <laughs> yeah, it was like, what are all you people doing here? <laughs> and then I went to New York for the first time at 10, 10 years old. And I was like, yes, this is, this, this is what life yeah, is supposed is, to be this. like. <laughs> This this I've never matches been to with, Maryland, so I can't I can't imagine what it's like. It's just it's just a normal it's just it's a normal just, place. There's yeah. not it's like it's a normal place. But you uh, were like I was born for excitement. I was born for New York City. You know, it's like somebody made a mistake. The start was like a little bit off. You know, exactly. so you rectified it when you were 18 and you went there. You made it. You know, so, yes, it was like a relief. Yeah. <laughs> so when you got to New York, you're like, this is it. And every year it kept getting better and better until. Yeah. The pandemic made you, you know, reassess things, or just before that, you were well, actually. To realize. 
honestly, the first time I went to LA was when things began to change. I went to LA for the first time in 2010. Okay. Uh, and at that point, I had been in New York for a few years. I was still in college. Okay. Um, and I, when I saw what LA was like, I was like, hmm, I could get into this. I could really get into this. You know, LA helped me declare my major, my, my studies at Fordham, because I hadn't really declared. I knew I was going to study media, but I didn't know what sect of media I was going to study. And then, you know, going to LA, I did lots of movie studio tours. And then I realized, okay, I really think I want to study film and television. Um, so it helped with that. Um, it helped me see what different lifestyles were like, you know, you know, I had a lot of friends in college who were from LA yeah. and I had never experienced weather like that. Yeah. <laughs> like I, and I think people don't really realize how much weather affects your body and affects your mood. Yeah, your like mood it has so much to do with it. And that temperate, temperate climate just agreed with me so, so well. <laughs> and ever since then, you know, I kind of had my eyes on it. And then I had sort of something to compare New York to, to because exactly. I was always comparing New York to Maryland. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I had, you know, something else to compare New York to. So it was like, kind of like, oh, okay, there's more out there. There's more for me to experience. There's more for me to get to, to do in terms of lifestyle and where I, where I live. Now, how did, how did, I know you lived in Madrid for a year. How did that come about? Yes. Was it while you were living in New York? Tell us about that experience. Oh, oh my God. So crazy, <laughs> crazy, craziest thing. I studied abroad okay. in college for a summer with Boston University. I studied abroad oh. with Boston University. Yep. Oh, my sisters um, went to school there. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't go to BU because I went okay. to school in New York. I went to Fordham University in New ah, York. Sorry, yeah, but Fordham has a really good partnership with Boston University for study abroad. Um, so all of the credits directly transfer over. No oh, problem. Cool. Um, so I studied abroad with BU for a summer and, you know, so I spent like two months in Madrid for a summer and I really liked it. You know, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and at the end, you know, I was like, I kind of feel like that wasn't enough. And I, you know, I had an understanding that Madrid was not a place that I would want to live long term. Yeah. But I did also have an understanding that I did want to stay there for longer than two months. Yeah. So, and you know, it was funny because I was meeting a lot of people that summer that I was there. I made a lot of friends and, you know, they would always ask me, well, when do you think you'll come back? Well, when do you think you'll come back? And I was like, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, uh, I'm <laughs> I in college and I, and then come like, back with it. right. It's like, I'm in, I'm in college and I have <laughs> no money. So I, like, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> but it's funny every time I would I got asked that question a lot and every time I would answer I don't know you know there was a voice in my head that would say the they would repeat the exact same thing every time I would answer the question and it would say you're going to be back here sooner than you think you will yeah <laughs> and like and I was just like every time I was like oh that's weird I, I would hear it as clear as day like in my just like in my spirit I could just hear that um, and so I came back to, came back to New York. Um, this was to do my, to complete my last year at university. And like the idea of going back to Madrid would just not get out of my head. It yeah. would not leave me. Um, and I think it was New Year's Eve, 2011, going into 2012, I was at a party and somehow the topic came up of me potentially moving to Spain like oh why don't you go back why don't you go back and a couple drinks into that conversation on New Year's <laughs> Eve I was just like all right I think I've made the decision I'm gonna do it wow um and the crazy thing about that was okay so the first time I went and I studied abroad uh I get there and I'm there for about a week and then I'm on Facebook mm -hmm. I'm sitting in my room and I'm on Facebook and I see that one of my friends from college is in Madrid. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what? What is he doing here? So I, I message him and he's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm here for the summer. Um, I'm studying, I'm doing this like medicine program. He's a doctor now. So he was doing a, a medicine sort of program in Spain for the summer. And so I got to hang out with one of my good friends that whole summer. And the crazy thing was, oh, so I decided to move back. I got all of the stuff in order um and was ready to go 
And one day I was talking to this same friend and he says to me, so I'm going back to Spain. I'm going back to Madrid um, in the fall, in the fall of 2012. And I was like, are you serious? And he's like, yeah, why? And I'm like, because I'm going back to Madrid wow. in the fall of 2012. That is so and, cool. And, but no, not even just that, like, other friends of mine were also doing the exact same thing. It was the, cra- <laughs> it was the, it was the craziest thing ever. It was like, like okay, so that? every, so everybody I know wants to move to Madrid now. Great. Let's all go. Let's all go. Um, and so, yeah, I got to go and it was great because I had lots of friends, like friends that I had already had in Spain, yeah. friends from New York who had decided to move to Spain. So in that regard, like that whole part of it was, was great. And, you know, really helped me take that leap that's great now how did you go about getting the the visa and everything was it hard at that time too like how was, you know, how was the process for you it's actually pretty easy um so i found a program online um right after that new year's eve party i just got online you know because i had met lots of when i studied abroad i met lots of english teachers in madrid Mm-hmm. You know, everyone sort of said the same thing. It's just like a really easy way to legally live in Spain and make exactly. money. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, Spain loves to bring in people who can help their people with English. Yeah. Of course. And, you know, I wasn't really interested in, you know, teaching languages or anything like that, but I understood that it was something that I could do. I knew yeah. it would be sort of a low lift. Um, and so I found this government program with the Spanish government. They had this program where, They have this program where they bring Canadians, Americans, Mm -hmm. Brits, Australians, and the like Mm -hmm. to Spain. And they place them all over the country in the public school system Mm -hmm. um, as English teaching assistants. Mm -hmm. So I applied for that program, had no idea whether or not I was going to be accepted because like this was the time that Spain was going through that terrible, terrible economic crisis. Uh-huh. Of course, and yes. so they were, they were limiting drastically the amount of students that they were bringing mm-hmm. to, to teach English. Mm-hmm. And it was basically, if you meet the requirements like college graduate, you mm-hmm. know, they were very, the requirements were not very, you know, intense. Mm-hmm. And if you meet the requirements, you'll essentially get accepted. So it's first come first serve. Yeah. And I had a very high num- application number. Yeah. So I was like, eh, I don't know if I'm going to get it. <clears throat> <laughs> I'll see you guys there someday. <laughs> no, so no, what I did was I, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was supposed to be there. And so I just said, you know what, I'm going to go regardless and I'm going to figure it out crazy right yes <laughs> just move across move across <laughs> the world the I tell people not to do on the e-course you know <laughs> <laughs> move across the world and just figure it out <laughs> and the only reason i was able to do that i i just i knew i knew i knew i knew that i was supposed to be there um can't explain it but i just knew um and i found i was like i found a school that would give me an English cert- English teaching certification in Madrid. Okay. Um, and then they would help with, you know, job yes. placement, uh-huh. you know, working in banks or schools, whatever mm-hmm. it was. They, you know, had a connection with uh, a uh, uh, language academy in the city in Madrid that mm-hmm. was able to process the student visa for us. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of that just kind of worked like, out yeah. in that regard. Um, and I got there took my English certification course for a month. It was a group of maybe like seven of us, seven Americans. Um, And we all became really good friends. Um, And then I started working in a bank, teaching in the morning, teaching in the afternoon. Ended up getting let go from that job, which was a whole nother story. But before I got let go from that teaching job in Madrid in the bank, I got an email. This was about October. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I got let go from the job in November and like mid October, I got an email from the Spanish government mm-hmm. and in the email I was like, Hey, remember that program that you applied for back in January uh-huh. to be an English teaching <laughs> assistant in the public school system. Guess what? Your application has officially been accepted That's and your school is ready for you. Wow. 
Now, I knew applying that that was a chance that that could happen because, you know, I talked to lots of people who had done the program before. Yeah. And the idea was if you get a late acceptance, they expect mm -hmm. you to come for the second semester of the school uh -huh. year. Okay. So this was October. So that yeah, made yeah, perfect so sense. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but here's the crazy part. It was, I swear to you, it was a divine act of God <laughs> because not, I was accepted late, but I still got my first choice city to teach in, which Madrid. was Madrid, Wow. which was the place that I had lived. Because my thing was, oh, well, you know, if I get accepted, I'm probably not going to get Madrid. Yeah, you'll be like uh, in Puerto Rico. In Valencia. It could be in Valencia. It exactly. could be in Granada. Be, not even you that. Know, you'll be, be like some little village outside of. Yeah. Or, right. Or that like I could be in Cuenca somewhere. I know. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and, <clears throat> and I was like, oh, my God, Madrid. And, you know, but this time I was working at the bank. I was also working as a tour guide doing Segway tours of Madrid <laughs> for tourists. So you're like, I'm just, <laughs> I've got a lot so I was of like, <laughs> So I was like, I don't really need that right now. But something in my spirit said, don't tell them no. Exactly. Something in my spirit just said, just let the email sit there. Mm -hmm. Ended up getting a let go from the bank job. Um, and I knew that my tour guide job was not going to be enough. It's not. Um, and so I went, um, told the guy who I was doing tours for that I was going to leave. And literally, I left his office, walked 10 minutes up the street on Gran Via. If you know Madrid, there's yeah, Gran Via. Yeah, I do. <laughs> that, so on Gran Via is where the Ministry of Education is. <laughs> So I just walked 10 minutes up the road. Like, I'm there. <laughs> told, the secu told security, like, hey, I need to speak to this person. They let me right up. And I went upstairs. And I was like, hey, so uh, I'm here. I'm going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm formally accepting this position. <laughs> when can I start? And he's like, wow, this is. And they were looking at me. They were looking at me like I had five heads. Yeah. <laughs> because, like I said, they want, they don't expect people who get late accept acceptances exactly, to show to up. Say, yeah. Uh huh. I certainly until, not to show up in the office. You know? Right. They don't expect you there until January, and they also are expecting for you know you to work with them to exactly. get you know all of your visas and all you, of that yeah, stuff exactly. together. But I'd already had it all worked out. Yeah. And they were like, wait, so you're here? And I'm like, yeah, I'm here. And they're like, so you have. A student, you, like, like you have a visa, and I was like, like, I yeah. Do. And they were like, "How did you get a visa?" And I was like, mm, "Don't worry about that." No, exactly. Just <laughs> accept the fact that I'm here. <laughs> Don't worry about that. But you see this passport with the visa right in it. I have exactly. It. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> and they, you know, she got on the computer. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Yeah, yeah, that's him. That's his school. They're ready for you. You can show up tomorrow. <laughs> And just, so it was meant to be. <laughs> just like that. Wow. And then I had a, I had a steady job for, un, like for the entire time that I initially planned to be there. That's great. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And of course, the cost yeah. of living compared to New York was. Whew, it was such a relief. It was such <laughs> okay, a relief. Okay, tell us because... tell us how, how much it was there. You know, so, so here's the so thing. They were jealous. They were paying us a thousand euros a month, mm -hmm. and that was enough to live, to eat, to go out, to travel. <laughs> like, like, you know, like, it was insane. It was insane. The, that's a, a. It's amazing because one of the things that I try to impress some people, like on the e course, is like if you're willing to make that change, you know, you're so used to the American prices and how much it is. You can't believe how much cheaper it is in Spain, for instance, in France. I mean, just about every place else. People rush to Asia because it's, it's cheaper and everything. But when you think about it, Europe is just as reasonable. It really is. It's, it really, really you know, is. And I'm trying to impress that upon people that even though you don't think you can, you really can. So here you are, testament, somebody who lived there who's saying that on a thousand euros, he was able to live in Madrid, okay? In mm -hmm. Madrid. And, and, here's, and here's the kicker that'll really drive it home. The thousand euro pr uh, payment was only if you were placed in Madrid. If you were anywhere else, they were giving you like a, like 
like probably about six or seven hundred euro. Imagine because that. outside of Madrid, yeah. the cost of living is even it's cheaper. Even cheaper, I think. Like in, like, like in Granada. Like, I could not get over how cheap everything was in Granada. Like, and here's what I would tell people. In Granada, we would, on a night out in Granada, we would stop ordering drinks and food when we were out of coins. <laughs> because <laughs> that is how cheap, because cheap that's food. how cheap everything is. <laughs> and of and course, so it's like, I, the tapa, right? With the drink. Right. <laughs> and it's like, I don't really want to break my 20 euro bill. <laughs> No. Once this five dollar, so, five euro is gone, this is it. Right. So like, once these coins are gone, <laughs> we're done. So like, your coins will get you through the whole night. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? I mean, people need to know. Like, stop watching just everything they pour down your throat in the U.S. Life outside the U.S. is so much more reasonable. You know, people go to Mexico because of that. They go to all this place. You know, Ecuador because of that. But a thousand euros, and even today, I think we've upped it since like 2012. And I think in Madrid, they pay them like 1200 now or something. But I mean, that's still enough to have a good life. And it's not saying that you have to do it forever, especially if you have a degree, right? It's something right. to, it's a way for you to come in and get to know the country. Maybe you, you know, you live there while you think I want to, you know, I want to stay longer and then you can look for other ways to stay. So here yep. you are telling people it's doable. I mean, so doable. <laughs> that's so doable. I'm, I actually really want to come back. Um, yeah. <laughs> not for, not for like a year. I want to, you know, I really want to, once this pandemic I know has come I know down. it's like everything is post or pre post you know it's like you can't plan you know solidly yeah it's I really want to come I really want to come for like three months um and really get to see the places that I didn't yeah, really didn't get see. to see yeah. um like I've been to Granada several times but like I've never spent a significant amount of time there like I want to spend like a month in Granada yeah. I want to do a month in Barcelona mm. um you know I want to travel to País Vasco uh Galicia all these places that I never really got to see while I was there because I had spent so much time in Madrid and, yeah um and then you know really just go somewhere that where I know I won't have to break the bank. Exactly, you know? you know? And it's like a whole bunch of places in Spain. There's so many places that you can go to where you're not breaking the bank. Now, when you come back, you know, you say to yourself, after the pandemic, I'll come back. And you're going for three months on an American passport. You can go for three months without needing any sort of visa. And I tell exactly. people that's also a great way to come and see if you will like the country. It's a great way because, you know, with that blue passport, there's so many countries you can go to without needing something except for after 90 days. So Correct. it's great if you have that urge and you can go and check out other countries and see if you like it or not, because you never know. If you don't like it, hey, you can always go back home, right? You exactly. Know? <laughs> now, when exactly. you were there and you went back, you know, then you had to adjust back to the New York prices. So it was like, <laughs> so you had culture shock and then you had oh to my reverse God. culture I have shock. A <laughs> I have a great story about that. I have a great story about that. So the culture shock did not happen after the year in Madrid. Okay. The culture shock happened the first time after the summer in Madrid. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, because, and people were very, people were like, how, how, did you have culture shock coming back home? You were only there for a summer. And I, I would tell people, you got to understand, like, uh, like I'm, I'm truly bilingual, mm -hmm. which meant I was really able to immerse myself exactly. and just be like, lost yeah, in yeah. the culture. Uh -huh. So it was like the American sensibilities were the furthest thing from my mind. Like me, and it was funny, I got there, studied abroad, the school picked us up and I was on the bus and I was sitting next to this guy who was in the program with me and we started talking and he was like, Oh, where do you go to school? I was like, I go to Fordham in New York city. Um, he's like, Oh, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from Baltimore. He's like, Oh, you're from Baltimore. Crazy. I'm from New York city, but I go to school in Baltimore. <laughs> and I was like, are you, are you serious? And he's like, yeah, I go to Hopkins. He went to, he was a Johns Hopkins student. 
Um, and so he and I like became really good friends and we kind of, we didn't really want to have an American experience abroad. Yeah, you so we kind of, yourself, yeah. we kind of disassociated ourselves from the other students in the program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and we went and made Spanish friends yeah. and European friends. Um, no, so I was, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you for one second, ahead. just to mention that for those who don't know, Steven is completely fluid in Spanish. Yes. I mean, completely. So for him, the experience must have been even richer than somebody who yes. was just an American going. Sorry, I just exactly. wanted to mention that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I was really able to get in it and just get lost in it. Um, and uh, so I came back. I came back. I flew back to New York um <clears throat> and went right to the college dorm um i wasn't actually like in like i wasn't i didn't have like a room in the dorm but like i had some friends who were there for the summer so i was in the dorms and we went out the very same night that i got back and i remember it being like 11 o'clock at night and we were on the lower east side of manhattan and i'm just looking around and everyone is so drunk but like, vi like pissy, sloppy, Drunk. visibly, like throwing up in the streets, <laughs> stumbling down the sidewalk. Full New York experience. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Something that is completely normal in New York City. But because I had been in Spain, where when it comes to alcohol and drinking, people are a lot more in control of themselves. Yes, yes. I was looking around like, what? Like, is it a full moon? Like, what is going on? And then a friend pulled me aside. Uh, she was an American. Mm -hmm. However, she lived most of her life on a military base in Italy. Okay. And so she pulled me aside and she had that sort of perspective to be able to tell me, I, yeah. I know what's happening. Yeah. You're having culture shock <laughs> from having lived in Europe for the first time. Yeah. And, you for, and because you spoke Spanish and you could really immerse yourself, exactly. you kind of forgot how things work over You're here. Like, what are these people <laughs> and I was like, what is going I remember I went to the bank machine to get money out. And this, this green paper came out of the bank machine <laughs> just, and i <laughs> and i sat there for, i swear i sat there for five minutes at the bank machine like what is this i know it's like where's my you money, money. <laughs> and like what is they just took like what this is not money and then i went oh wait, like wait, who wait, do wait, i complain okay, to back. i know it's like yeah right, i was like who do i complain to, to? It's, switch it's, you had to switch back you know and, and imagine that was just three months so i can just imagine you know the whole year that was there that you were there well, now, well the year was a lot easier yeah um, the year was a lot easier because i knew what to expect and also i came back for the christmas holidays okay um mm -hmm. and so i came back for the christmas holidays i flew into new york spent like a week in New York City, then came to Maryland, spent like a week in Maryland with my family, then drove back to New York City because I was gonna fly back out of New York City. Um, so I really got, you know, to sort of dip my toes back in the US, yes, then go back to Spain. Oh, um, so <laughs> and so yeah, the culture shock, I, I kind of got a hold of it uh, that second time around. <laughs> now, now I got to ask you, when you were in Madrid, as a uh -huh. black guy, did you have a lot of problems with racism? Like, did you feel like... Not problems. I would not, I was not discriminated against and there were no problems, but there were definitely racially uh, charged experiences. Okay. Um, I wouldn't really call them problems. Um, but not enough to racial. say I would never come back here or, no, you know, I can't no, live here no. is not. Not at all. Not at all. And I, you know, I took it and I've, and I've talked about this on YouTube. Um, yeah, I, I remember seeing that video. And I'm going to um, link to it in the um, comments. But, you know, there were, there were things like, oh, uh, you know, like once a guy just walked up to me in the street and asked me if I was from Africa. <laughs> I'm just like, what? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Nice to I meet know, you. Really? Like, um, well, I have to say, one of the kids in my in my school when I first moved to America, the first question we, you know, I went to prep school in Boston, and she was like, 
do you like uh, swing on trees and don't have any clothes on? You know, and I was just like, <laughs> yes, that's you know, exactly she what saw we Tarzan, do. And so, you know, that was the thing. So, yeah. What did you tell? What did you, how did you answer him? I just looked at him kind of crazy and said no. And he walked away. Okay. Um, like, uh, Spain is the only time I've ever been stopped by the police. Ah. Yeah. That's the, it's never happened to me in the U S it has happened. It happened. It's happened in Spain twice. And what happened? Nothing. Again, nothing dramatic. Um, the first time it happened, the first time it happened, it was probably the perfect day for it to happen because I didn't really, I, I was, I had to go into the school and I really wasn't feeling well that morning. And I was in the Metro station. They stopped me. They showed their badge, asked me for my ID. You know, they see that it's an American and they're like, oh, okay, go. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and then the second time I was just walking around my neighborhood, uh, pretty late at night. I lived in the suburbs, mm -hmm. um, and the cops were just patrolling mm -hmm. and they saw me walking, um, and they just stopped, they stopped, rolled their window down and asked me if I was okay. <laughs> See, <laughs> you're like, yeah, I'm fine, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Thank you so much. Um, and that was it. Um, Lots of people, uh, you know, who, you know, are attracted to me wanting to, uh, you know, have that sort of interaction with me because they don't get to necessarily do that often. It's not like yes. America where there are black people. Yes. I mean, there are black people everywhere in Spain, yeah, yeah. but not like how not it is like, in, yeah. Especially not like the, even in 2012, you know, it's only right. a few years, but it's changed a lot right. since then. Yeah. You know, it's not like, it wasn't like the U.S., it wasn't like the U.K., um, so it was a little bit rarer for them. Um, so lots of stuff like that. But, it's, but, um, but nothing we, like super, oh my God, you know, because that's one no. question people ask no. and they say, you know, I don't want to go there because I read somewhere, somebody told me that they were profiled or whatever, and so I'm not going to go there. And I'm like, well, you know, the same thing happens in the U.S., it happens yeah. everywhere else. You can't let that stop you. And compared mm -hmm. to the U.S., I think it's a lot less. Mm -hmm. But, you, know, you know, everybody... Lots of, uh, so yeah, just like lots of racially like, oh, you're saying this because it's a black person. And it wouldn't necessarily be anything bad, you but know, no. like, oh, I'm talking. And then they're like, oh, are you from Cuba? Like, <laughs> no, no, I'm not from Cuba. You think it's because they couldn't place you because here you are speaking Spanish perfectly. And, you know, it's just for them. They can't find them like an American speaking Spanish, you know, it's like, it's so rare that they must and, peg you right. in some little thing. So it's, like, and, then, <laughs> it's and then also you add on the fact that, you know, I, my Spanish was learned in the United States, predominantly around Caribbeans. Yeah. Um, so my natural Spanish accent has a lot of Caribbean influence as well. Uh, I mean, it's funny when I'm in Spain, everyone is like, oh my God, you sound so Latino and Caribbean. <laughs> Uh, oh and then, like, I would come to the U.S. and everyone is like, you sound so Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you can't win, right? <laughs> you can't win. Can't win. But you're can't like, win. I don't care which one as long as I can speak it. Now, you, cool. your, um, your video, your YouTube channel is called mm -hmm. American Boy. Yes. It, like, it's, it's, it's great. Now, how did you decide or why did you decide to do it strictly in Spanish? Because, <clears throat> so I am a creative by nature. You know, I'm a musician. I, I was an actor in high school. Um, you know, I studied film and television in college. Like I'm just a creative by nature. And around, uh, once I got back to New York and started my career, I was working at MTV, the, the television, the music television network. Um, and, you know, working, in the creative field, but not necessarily on the creative side, I, it was really important to me to start building out my own personal creative footprint. Yeah. Uh, and the thing that I kept hearing from other creators that I admired was find the thing that's going to be super, super specific to you. Mm -hmm. Like, try to find the thing that really only you can do. Yeah. Um, 
And I was thinking about that for a while. And I swear, like, again, uh, one night I was just in my bed about to go to sleep. And it just, the idea just popped into my head like that. Just like, just, it was there. Now, when that happened, I couldn't really see what it was going to be. Like, I couldn't see, like, the ideas weren't coming to me. Like, this video, that video, this video. Like, that wasn't there. But I could feel so strongly, like, very in the same sense that, like, I knew I was supposed to go to Spain. Mm -hmm. I could feel so certainly that something was there um, and that I was going to figure it out. Yeah. Fast forward to a couple of months. It's December. And I visit Puerto Rico for the first time. Ah, nice. <laughs> I visit Puerto Rico for the first time. And I went like two days after Christmas. Um, and, you know, I was with some really close friends of mine that are from Puerto Rico with their families. Uh, we did New Year's in Puerto Rico. It was, it was, that is one of my favorite trips I've ever, ever taken. Nice. Um, and during that trip, we actually... That trip was so cool because I got to have a vacation from my vacation because I flew to San Juan to be with my friends and have my vacation. Their family does a New Year's vacation to another town in Puerto Rico. So after I'm there for like four days, we pack up all the food, all the sangria, and we drive to the other side of the island to go to the beach house. So it's like I'm on vacation but then I go on vacation while I'm on vacation. It was amazing. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> and so one night we're all sitting around, sitting around the beach house, drinking sangria. And someone asks me, a Puerto Rican, a Puerto Rican, one of my friends, she asks me, you know, she asked me about like, different Spanish accents and why they're different and, you know, why am she I wanted to understand if I had any awareness of why Puerto Ricans spoke the way they do versus like a Mexican or a Spanish person. And her reason for asking this was she said, you know, I, I'm born and raised here. So I've never really thought about it. This yeah. is just how we speak. I've never really thought why it's different. And without preparation, without even having to think about it, I just started talking and telling her everything I knew about different Spanish accents and how they came to be and how they developed over time. And I was talking for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and as I'm talking about this language and dialects and the development of the language in my head, it was like, this is your this YouTube is channel. This is, this is it. Gotcha. Um, it. It was like, it's that thing that you just know down to yeah. your bones that you can, someone asks you a question, you can just sit there and talk about it without any preparation. Yeah. And that was it. And yeah. there it was born. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my friend, one well, different friend on New Year's Eve, we were sitting around eating and he said to me, and I, it was already kind of in my head. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, and I hadn't told anybody. Yeah. And he said to me, you know, you should really think about like doing some sort of creation in Spanish. He said that to me, <laughs> not knowing that it was already it's like, like ever, yeah, exactly. It's like, not knowing it was already in my head. Um, and I was like, you know, I think you might be right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's great because I think that's one language, even though YouTube is popular everywhere, obviously there's more English speakers. Now to have somebody who's doing it in Spanish, and being able to switch back. I've watched some of the interviews you've done with others who've also learned another language and it's just fantastic. And since I discovered your channel, I've been listening to you speak and I'm like, I can understand what he's saying. So it really yes. helps. And I think it helps both in English and in Spanish. So, you know, and it's rare to find those. So I'm always on the look at it like, oh, wow. So I'm really going through your back catalog trying to like, you know, get better in Spanish and it's been great. So, you know, and you that, hit upon a really great idea. And that's one of the things I really want folks to understand about language. It's not all, it's not a hundred percent about the words being said. Like the communication is so much more than just the words being said. And so I tell people, if you're trying to learn a language, you'll have a better time understanding someone who also speaks your native language when they speak that foreign language. 
And I've seen this consistently. When I was teaching English in Madrid, um, you know, I would show, I kind of understood this. So I would show like, I would like show them interviews, right? Of like, you know, maybe it's like a cast of a TV show. Let's say Modern Family, for example, right? Yeah. Let's watch this interview from the cast of Modern Family, right? Well, there's a Colombian woman in that cast, mm -hmm. right? Who's bilingual. Mm -hmm. And they would always be like, oh, wow, when she speaks English, I understand every <laughs> word she says. And I said, yeah, because she also speaks your native language. Yeah. Uh, my friend Dylan, uh, I'm learning French, but for some reason, when he speaks French, I can understand everything he says. My French is very rudimentary, yeah. but because he's my best friend and I know him so well, he speaks a foreign language that I don't really know. I can still understand what he's saying. Yeah. Um, I see what so you mean. That, that's, yeah. yeah. It's true. No, it's great. So once again, it's called American Boy. You want to check it mm -hmm. out. And I also want to hear about the, the book. You know, tell us about your book what it's about so when i started youtube and started making videos about language you know i ha really understand that like you're really not gonna get everything that i have to offer in terms of how i was able to do this in a 10 minute youtube video yeah it just i I've, i always understood that i wanted to put something out that was a bit more substantial mm -hmm. for the people who really wanted to dive in. Yeah. And so I had this book idea for a long time. And for a long time, it was just like, oh, I'm gonna write a book about language learning and like sort of my experience. But it took a really long time for me to figure out what story I was gonna tell and sort of through what sort of lens I was gonna tell the story. Um, and so what the book is essentially is a different way of looking at language learning. So often we're inundated with like techniques, mm -hmm. right? Techniques, do this, do that, try Duolingo, try Rosetta Stone, this trick, that trick, go to this language school, they're the best. No, go to that language school, they're the best. <laughs> take this test, take that test, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. What I have learned having become bilingual is that language learning is not so much a question of being able to execute all of these actions and techniques and methods. And it has much more to do with your transformation as a human being. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with how your identity shifts and grows through the language. That is really what it's about. And what I've realized is if you're trying to learn a language and you're trying to become fluent, and you're trying to maintain that ability for your entire life, you really have to become aware of this identity shift that is happening while you're going through the process. And when you become aware of that shift, you then begin, begin to design the sort of the process and the results that you're looking to get. You can literally you know, you don't have to rely on Duolingo. You don't have to rely on your teachers or your professors or anything like that, which so many students do. They think, oh, I've taken this class and the class is going to make me bilingual. Yeah, it's like, no, you are going to make you bilingual yeah. because you are the one that has to go through this shift in identity. It is literally a, an identity transformation and you have the ability to design what that transformation looks like if you're aware that that's what it is. So essentially it puts the power into the learner themselves to realize if you take inventory of the thoughts that are in your head, the things that you believe, your intentions for even learning the language in the first place, like yeah. why you're actually doing this and you know what, how it connects to what you really value in life, that is how you're then able to create a life that is rooted in that language mm -hmm. and an identity that is rooted in that language because you're gonna be conscious of all of these things. Yeah. And it wasn't until you know, years later that I even realized this, yeah. uh, but once I realized that that's what it was, because for me, I never relied on just, I never relied on just my school to teach me Spanish. Why? Because I was going out in public you know, trying to practice with native speakers in public because they're everywhere in the United States. Exactly. The United States, yeah, the United States is a Spanish-speaking exactly. country. Yes, 
yes. um, which is how I was able to learn it here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and I realized when I was young, I was having trouble really understanding people outside of the classroom. And that's when I realized, oh, the classroom is not giving me the real thing. Yeah. The classroom is not giving me the real thing. So I went out into the world um, and then I started to make close relationships. You know, then I got a Spanish speaking job in high school. And so this life started to form around me learning this language. And then that new life began to shape my identity. Uh, And so then it no longer became a question of, oh, well, you know, my teacher's really not that good, or the class I'm taking is really not that good. That didn't even, that that wasn't the case. I did, I I had a really good Spanish education um, in terms of learning, but a lot of people don't have good, good, you know, learning experiences in a classroom. But I, but once I realized, oh, you know, more is going to come from what I do outside of this classroom then it's going to come from inside of the classroom. That's kind of when the wheel started turning. And so that's essentially what the book is about. The book is all about showing you how to take inventory of your actual internal power to go through this identity shift and learn this language and how you do that mentally, how you should think about it, how you should approach it, and how you should really um, design, design a life and design an identity around this. And And the thing that I really want to drive home is the universal intention and purpose behind language learning, right? Because what's the number one reason everyone in the world wants to learn a new language? What would you say? Hopefully to travel and communicate with somebody. Travel is one of them. Travel is one of them. With somebody, you know, know, with other people so they can understand you. Travel is one of them. But the number one thing I hear is I want to make more money. Really? That's why they mm-hmm. want to learn another language. That's the number one thing I hear. And that probably has to do with the fact that it's, that's a U.S. thing. Okay. Uh, because, uh, and it goes for both languages, English and Spanish. Yeah. Spanish speakers in the U.S. want to learn English to make more money. English speakers in the U.S. want to learn Spanish to make more money. Um, mm-hmm. So that is sort of the thing I hear. And so what I'm really driving home with this book is regardless of what it is that you're trying, whatever external benefit that you're trying to gain, the universal intention behind languages is human connection. Uh-huh. So, so if your goal really isn't tied to something bigger than you, to, to connecting with other humans and really figuring out what you can do through this language to make someone else's life better, uh-huh. you really should figure that out before you really commit yourself to trying to do this. Uh, Because at the end of the day, when you learn a language, right, Mm -hmm. the amount of people around the world that you're able to communicate and interact with, it increases tenfold. And for me, what is the point of having that ability if you're not going to do it to make someone's life better? And you're just going to do it for whatever it is that you can gain. But learning that language is really not about you. It's about you being able to communicate with other people. And if you're going to be able to communicate with other people, you have to be offering them something. You have to make their life better. They should be better off after having interacted with you. And you should be better off after having interacted with them. And, well, if, you're only do- <laughs> and if you're only doing this, if you're only doing this because, oh, you want to get that new job that's going to, you know, get you more money. Or, you know, you just want to have, you know, a nice apartment in Valencia or Madrid. You know, if that's your motivation, that, that's fine. And, you know, it'll, it'll help you to an extent, but when things start getting difficult, when things get hard, it's going to be much harder to persevere through that, those difficulties that you're going to go through, through the process. If your motivation is some external benefit like money or getting to travel or having a Spanish speaking girlfriend or boyfriend or something like that, (laughs) like those are fine motivations. (laughs) Those are fine motivations to get you started, you know, but what happens when you get that job and then a year later, you're like, okay, I want, I did it. (laughs) I want to do something else. Like, are you still going to stay committed? (laughs) That happens a lot. People change their minds, you know, with, Mm -hmm. with so many things. I wanted to make sure that I wanted to learn Spanish, but now 
I know what you're talking about, about that change, because I see it happening in me and I'm just like, okay, okay. And every day my, my thoughts are like switching just a little bit. And what's this book called? I've seen, I've read about it, but it's like, what's so the name the, of the, 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 the English language title is Being Bilingual. Being, Being bilingual. bilingual, the mindful map towards language learning for language learners and lovers. Where can they get that? It will be available on Amazon uh, oh, okay. in 2021. Great. So we'll yep. put the link down here. Once it's available, we'll edit yep. it and show it. And, uh, you know, I am so glad that you came on the show. And I had one last question for you. You've, been, oh, yes, you've traveled to quite a few places. I what have. would you say was you, would be your favorite, apart from Los Angeles, where you want to live? Mm. Like, where would you say was the best country that you visited and you just like, oh my God, I loved it so much? Um, there are two places that have a very special place in my heart. One would be Granada, España. See? Um, oh, yes. wow. Granada is a magical place it's funny i still haven't been there i've heard so many good things and we used to live in malaga right it was right next door but it's just one of those things you're like yeah we'll go tomorrow we'll go tomorrow and then you never get to it but we still me, plan on going there let me put it to you this way every time i go to granada i can feel the spirit of god moving through the city wow Are i can sure? just feel it wow <laughs> i can just feel it without a shadow of a doubt I'm like, you don't think it's too hilly. You don't think it's, you just loved it. Cause you know, it has everything. It has the Alhambra. It has, you know, the, I forget what the neighborhood is. Um, And you know what, the the Albacin. The Albacin, exactly. So Mm -hmm. you're just like, you're in love when you think about it, huh? So Spain would still be the number one. Well, and the second place is London. See, for me, London is number one and Spain is number one, you know, because but I couldn't afford to live there. So, you know, I'll just put that aside, but I like to visit, so. And well, the thing about London, the reason I love London so much is because, this is what I tell people, London is everything that New York City wants to be. Hmm. Yeah, I think London is, I think London, right. London is New York City if New York City was done correctly. <laughs> but you know, there are a lot of homeless people there now too, so. Yes. Yes, I think but you know, it's so expensive, you know, it's, it's so expensive. that part, <laughs> that part. It's just like, that's why I say it. it's New York. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah, New York. exactly. <laughs> it's, it's a very expensive still. still. And even more historic uh, New York. <laughs> but much more historic, much cleaner, much more efficient in terms of getting around. Yes. Um, the people are much more polite and warm. Yes. Um, people dress really well in London. Yes, they do. Yes, they, I like, think the reason my husband loves it so much. He's Italian, so like he he notices that first. It's like how they you dress <laughs> so well in the in London specifically, and it's just like you walk down the street in London, and you're like, "Am I in a yeah. magazine right now?" Exactly. Like, you 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 definitely see it. You know, you you see the difference, and it's like. You know, you're so used to like not dressing up. I mean, now it's gotten so bad in the U.S. You can go to, even by the time I left, you know, we go to to like a play, a Broadway show or whatever, and everybody's wearing sneakers. And it's just, there's nothing to dress up for anymore. Everybody's wearing like their ratty old clothes. And it's just, there's still something elegant about London, I guess. Correct. It, uh, it makes it. Correct. Um, makes it, and then uh, I think in both of those cities, people just really know how to enjoy life. Yes, people all the drink really a lot, so. <laughs> Also that, also that. Yeah, so I guess you, don't, you won't care about it too much after you've had a few in you. you know? That's so true. That's so <laughs> so I'm gonna true. End, I'm going to end this interview by practicing my Spanish with you for just a couple of minutes, if that's okay? Let's see. Uh, ¿Cómo es mi español? Uh, hola, Steven. Um, estoy muy feliz por, por el facto tú aquí. No? <laughs> I understand. Okay. Do, do you want me to help you through it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> eh, I would say eh, estoy contenta. Estoy contenta. Okay. Este, estoy contenta tenerte aquí conmigo 
in a podcast. I'm happy to have you here with me. I was going to say before, like, um, uh, quiero hablar, quiero hablar contigo, uh, mm -hmm. sobre español. Mi español mm -hmm. es muy mal, <laughs> solo siento. No está mal, no está mal, uh, está bien, yo te entiendo. Clase, um, acaba de terminar dos, mm -hmm. dos días pasado. Hace uh, dos días. Sí. Pasa, hace dos días. Hace dos días, sí. Uh -huh. Y me gusta mucho tus videos en YouTube uh, porque uh, ayúdame. <ríe> me ayudan. Me, me ayuda mucho uh, para aprender un poquito más español. Uh, uh -huh. Me alegro. Antes me alegro. <ríe> tenía mucho miedo. Uh, para hablar, pero ahora uh, intenta, <ríe> intentado con la gente cuando mm -hmm. salía. <ríe> so, <ríe> that's it for now. <ríe> Very good. <ríe> muy bien. Gracias. Muy bien. Muy, muy bien. No, I get so flustered when I try to speak it. I did something I eat. I talk to myself a lot when I watch TV because I'm like trying to repeat it. And then constantly trying to break the cycle because I see it in my head but by the time I go to say it, it just flies, se fue, you know, it's like but I'm gonna, you know, break through it, but the teacher keeps saying I'm, in, you know, I'm improving, but she's like you need a lot of conversation, so she says maybe next semester she's gonna put me in a class where it's more speaking that, she's like, you know the words you know the thing, so you need to just speak so, maybe. I would say the same thing because you know, you know Like you, you told me like, oh, your Spanish is very, very basic, but you know a lot of non-basic words. And I can tell that you're sort of familiar with more advanced sort of grammatical structures, even though you might not be an expert in them yet. I can tell you have, you have like sort of an awareness of where you need to go, yes. which is what people at a basic level don't really have. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like, I can tell that it's there and you kind of have it. Um, it's just going to be a matter of you doing what I did when I was a kid and going out to going out, there. Going out in Valencia, <laughs> listening to people, sparking up conversations with people, asking people, ask people for directions, even when you know where you're going. Okay. <laughs> and you know, everybody's like, listen to songs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep on trying. I'm going to keep talking to my television and doing all these things. And hopefully by next time you come visit with me again on the podcast, um, my English, my Spanish should be much better. <laughs> yes. And then I can, and then I can invite you on my podcast. Oh uh, yeah. Tell me about the, that. You apply, you would yeah, make so, a great podcaster. You oh, should, thank you. Tell me the plan. So, you know? Yeah. So once the book is out, yeah. I'm actually going to do a podcast, right. um, which sort of takes the premise of the book yeah. and puts it into podcast form. So, like I said, it's really about that, you know, identity shift and that transformation and all that that allows you to experience. Mm -hmm. So the, this podcast, what I want to do is I want to talk to people who have become bilingual in whatever language that that is. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to talk about, oh, try this technique, try that technique, go to this school, Duolingo. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about what has you going through this process done to shift your identity And how has it shaped your life experience? Like what things have you experienced and gotten to do and seen because you opted to learn another language? How did it change the trajectory of your life and your life experience and your identity? Because that is the conversation that no one ever seems to have when it comes to Now that you've told them, they didn't have it before you. <laughs> They're like, I stole this from me. <laughs> you know, because the stories, the stories are so so interesting i have a yeah. friend who i have a friend who is uh is mormon he's part of the mormon church mm -hmm. and he learned spanish when they sent him on his first mission wow. you know where they sent him where the bronx <laughs> they sent him to the bronx new york and now he speaks he's fluent like, spanish <laughs> that's great <laughs> And now he preaches the gospel. Now he preaches the gospel in Spanish. Salvador or something, you know. The Bronx. 
Yeah, because there's so many countries in the city. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You know, and, and there are the, there are all those crazy kind of just interesting stories that people would just never know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and when you really think about it in that perspective, for me, it's those experiences. It's those it's those experiences, those life altering, those identity shaping experiences that language learning is all about. It's yeah. not just so that you can pass the class or get the job or, you know, have the, you know, you know, I am fluent in this language on my resume. It's so much more than that. You know, it's really about that human connection. Because like I said, the example of my friend, he now preaches the gospel to people yeah. like in Spanish. in Spanish. Um, And, you know, so like he's able to go and help other people through him learning his language. Um, and those are sort of the conversations I want to have. I want to really introduce people to that sort of perspective when it comes to language learning. Awesome. That's great. I'm so looking forward to the podcast. And uh, yes. once again, you know, with this blog post and video, there will be all your information, your YouTube channel, the book, and how they can get in touch with you or sign up for, you know, a waiting list for the book or what have you. And don't forget everyone, when he starts his podcast, check out the YouTube. You'll just love yes. it, especially if you're trying to learn English or Spanish, actually. So, <laughs> so you, you know, you can't go wrong with, with his YouTube channel. It's called American Boy. So make sure to check it out. And Steven, thanks again for being on here. It's been wonderful. Thank you for having me. I think it's been the longest podcast I've ever done, but it was great. I didn't want it to end. It was really good. Yes. So thank you yes. once again. Everybody, thank, thank you, you for listening to Next Bite of Life. I hope to see you on the, um, the next episode. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel, please. No matter where you're listening, whether it's Apple, iTunes, or Spotify, or what have you. Thanks All of again, it. and we will see you.